Hello, I'm your host, David Barnard, and my guest today is Reed Duramis, Growth Product Manager at Substack. Prior to joining Substack, Reed helped grow subscriptions at Hulu, Crunchyroll, and HBO Max. On the podcast, I talk with Reed about whether or not to increase your price, how to execute if you do, and why price increases often impact growth more than retention. Hey, Reed, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. So I wanted to have you on. I have read a bunch of your posts this year. And anytime I read a great post, I think, gosh, more people need to read this. So I now work with my colleagues, publish a subclub newsletter. So I've shared your posts, I think, in three different newsletters. <laughs> and then I always think we're reading a great post. I wonder what else is behind this. Like, what would they say about this situation that wasn't covered? I said, hey, I've got a podcast. I figured I'd have you on and we could talk through some of your posts. So we'll link to the posts and your growth croissant blog in the show notes so people can go follow along if they want. Really great stuff. We're not going to like read the posts. We're not going to cover everything, but I want to kind of hit some of these major topics. So the most recent one you wrote, and I think is super applicable right now that a lot of apps are thinking should I increase my price? And then if I am going to increase my price, how do I do it and not get the backlash and everything? So I wanted to kick off talking about that. So let's just start with, should you raise your price? Well, thanks again for having me on and really appreciate the kind words. A lot of the times, like you'll write a newsletter post and you don't know if it lands or not. So really appreciate you and appreciate you sharing it. The price one was one that was timely because Spotify, which I've subscribed to for you know the past decade, is doing their first price increase. And I think they've kind of made it through by now. And there's a lot of writing out there. And it was something that we wrestled with a lot in the streaming world because it's like one of the most impactful ways to drive up customer lifetime value and drive up revenue. But there's this really hard balancing act with executing a price increase well. And the trade-offs are usually like, how much near-term revenue gain can I try to capture and without sacrificing your long-term growth potential? Because if you go too hard into the price increase, you may get a lot of revenue early on, but it could kind of erode your growth velocity. One specific metric to think about is your year-over-year -year growth in paid subscribers. That's the one that you kind of want to pay attention to after you do these price increases. And yeah, we can go a lot of different ways from there, but... I'm actually curious to get your take on Disney Plus and how this has played out. So they actually, again, announced a price increase recently, lambasted in the press, worst time ever to do a price increase. Everybody's complaining about Disney Plus quality going downhill. But it's interesting because they actually started at $5. And that kind of what you were saying and what you talk about in the post about growth versus profitability starting at $5 is probably a big reason why they grew so big so quick. It was just a no-brainer, cheap decision for a lot of families and people to stream. But now they're at that phase where, okay, growth is over. Where's revenue growth going to come from? More price raises. So do you think Disney Plus got it right, even with the backlash they're getting today in raising their prices now versus maybe having charged more early on? And it wasn't just Disney Plus. I think when we were at Crunchyroll, even Hulu too, the primary metric was paid subscribers. And baked into that was this assumption that over time you could gradually increase price. I think Disney launched at a really low price point. And a lot of people were getting Disney Plus for free as part of Verizon. They had like a pretty big partnership with them. They had really discounted annual plans at launch, if I remember correctly. And of course, they bundled it with ESPN Plus and Hulu, which I think a lot of people bought that as well. So when Disney Plus launched, there was a lot of, oh my gosh, they got to like 100 million subscribers so quickly. But you got to like dig into the numbers there and look at revenue per subscriber and really try to figure out, are they actually catching up with Netflix or are they still pretty far behind? And I think if you looked under the covers, the revenue per subscription wasn't quite there. Whether they're doing the right thing now, it's what they have to do. Like if you look at the streaming space broadly right now, it's not the easiest space to be operating in. It's been fascinating over the past decade, watching a lot of these traditional media companies try to move from cable TV into streaming video, where the skill sets needed to grow those products 
are very different. You have to like think about direct to consumer relationships and how to grow subscribers that way versus doing carrier deals with a handful or more pay TV operators. Totally different skill set. And the economics are really different. So I think it's been kind of a wild west and there's a lot of volatility right now. There's a lot of M&A. I think that consolidation will continue. Whether they handled it right or not, I don't really know. And I don't know if it really matters. I think they're doing what they kind of have to do at this point, along yeah. <laughs> with a lot of other streamers too. In that is kind of, and you talk about this in your post, is that you will get some level of pushback. And I mean, anytime somebody has to pay more for what they perceive to already be getting, there is going to be pushback. I'm a father of four kids and inflation's hitting pretty hard. I mean, I'm getting a little more sympathetic to maybe always raising prices isn't the best idea. How do you think about the consumer sentiment part of the decision of whether to raise prices or not? Well, one thing you mentioned there that I think is important is if you're asking them to pay more for what they perceive as the same product, it's a tough sell. Maybe a marginal price increase will go through, okay, like a $1 price increase, $2 price increase. That seems to be kind of the standard set by Spotify and Netflix. Each time they raise price, they're not doubling their price in one swing. They're kind of marginally going up. The thing that we've seen consumer products do well when they're doing a price increase is reaffirm the value prop that people are paying for. And you can also tease any upcoming changes that would like materially improve the product, the value prop. And I think that can really help get you through these price increases. And so I think communications are really, really important. And one of the things you mentioned in the post too was actually not just teasing future features, but maybe trying to coordinate the launch of a big new feature with the price increase. Like how would you pull that off? Exactly. Like if you were Disney and you had like some huge Star Wars series in the pipeline, I would try to time the price increase roughly around when those shows are going to premiere. And you could say in the comms, this is what we're doing with, we're not just asking you for more money for the sake of it. And don't blame a price increase on like inflation or something that <laughs> consumers can't control. That's kind of like one of those uncontrollable factors, like cost of gas is going up. Sorry, we got to increase our price. It's usually best to focus on your product and how it's getting better and how you're going to use this extra money to continue to make the product better. And keep in mind, the people who are paying for it already definitely value your product in some way. So they're going to be usually thrilled with that idea of you trying to make a concerted effort to continue to improve. The thing Disney, I think, actually did really well, maybe, is that they timed the press announcement before two big series. So Ahsoka was just released this week as we're recording, and then they have a big Marvel show coming out, I think, in the next three or four weeks. So they announced it two or three weeks ahead of that. They don't go into effect until mid-series with these big new shows. And so they kind of did what you're suggesting, and they took the PR lumps ahead. And now people are excited again because these big shows are coming on. And by the time the price increase actually takes effect, they're going to be mid-show on these exciting new shows that I think Disney had a lot of confidence that were going to be very attractive to their subscribers. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the best way to do it. Like if you're Spotify, you don't want to lose major podcast or Led Zeppelin or the Beatles catalog right before you do a price increase. The timing piece is really important. The communication is really important. So we've been talking about huge players, Disney, Spotify, a dollar increase in Spotify. You know, at this point, most people listen to music the way they listen to music is streaming. So there's not really that much question of like, am I going to cancel Spotify? It's maybe more, am I going to switch from Spotify to Apple Music? And there's only really two or three big players out there. I mean, what do you think? And have you done much thought on these smaller subscription apps where they don't have the brand name? They don't necessarily have the kind of default. People are going to stick around. Are there any tips in how a smaller app should think about a price increase. Let me bring it into like the Substack world because these are effectively all their own subscription media business. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one thing that we've talked with writers about, sometimes we'll do these reviews, you know, and we'll go in and we'll look at their retention metrics. 
their growth rate, all these metrics to evaluate the health of their business. And sometimes we'll say, hey, your paid retention rates are like through the roof. They're incredible. They're way better than your peers. And what we'll usually see is they're like, hell yeah. And then just totally tune out (laughs) and feel reassured. But there's a flip side to that, which is that can also mean that your product is underpriced or that you're not being aggressive enough trying to grow your audience. And so the phrase that we try to hammer home is your health metrics are too good. You know, it's like going into the doctor's office and they're like, look, you need to like eat a cheeseburger or something. (laughs) I think that's actually one thing. I see a lot of writers on Substack that I think are underpriced and they're not realizing their full earnings potential in part because they set their price a long time ago. It's a hard, intimidating decision. And after you make that decision, you don't really want to think about it again. So you just see a lot of prices kind of not changed even over the course of multiple years. And I feel like they're not realizing their full earnings potential. That's a great way to think about it. Because if (laughs) in our consumer subscription app world that we mostly talk about here on the podcast, if you're seeing way above median retention rates, if you're seeing way above median conversion to subscription rates, that might actually be the sign that you're leaving money on the table. But then on the flip side, if you're seeing 20% retention, which at RevenueCat, we shared a state of subscription apps report where median retention for a consumer subscription app on an annual plan is somewhere in the 30% range. So there's a lot of apps that have way lower than that, but then there's also a lot of apps that have way higher retention. But if you're in that 20% retention on your annual subscriptions, probably signal that you're not in a good place to raise prices on your existing subscribers. I hadn't really thought about kind of looking at those sorts of metrics as part of the decision-making process and whether to raise a price or not. We see some writers on Substack retaining 90% of their subscribers after one year, which to me is just like totally bonkers. Yeah. Um, And I want to give a shout out to Antenna, which is like a data product that really looks at retention for the streamers. And they have some really great retention data. If you are operating like a bigger consumer subscription product, that can be a good source of information to compare and contrast. It's obviously awesome. If your retention is above your peers or above normal, that's great news. But I too often see people put their feet on the table and be like, nice, let's let it cruise. (laughs) I think it's good to think about, well, maybe we are leaving some money on the table. Maybe we're a little underpriced. So, and then that's actually the next thing I wanted to get into is like, how do you model out whether or not you are leaving money on the table? And then how do you think about the potential for churn when you do raise your price? I mean, I can't show Excel spreadsheets in a podcast, but I mean, talk me through kind of the high level thinking of how to drop that into a data warehouse or a spreadsheet or how do you model this out to see if it's really worth it in the long run. Are you sacrificing growth in the short term? Are you sacrificing retention in the long run? I mean, there's a lot of factors here. The easiest avenues to break it out at the highest level is to think about your existing subscribers. Let's assume you're adjusting the price for your existing subscribers. A lot of people, when they do a price increase, they only do it for new subscribers in the future. And that's a fine approach, but just know that you're leaving the vast majority of the impact from a price increase on the table. To really realize the revenue gain from a price increase, it's important to figure out a way to increase price for existing subscribers. I would caveat that to say, if you're really early in your journey and there's not that many subscribers, that's the best time to just grandfather people in and not piss people off, not mess with your churn, like later stages when that's maybe most applicable. But that's part of the calculation, right? Like how many existing subscribers do I have? And if I raise price on all of them, is it actually meaningful revenue and worth doing? That's a great point. Keep in mind too, the people who you're talking about in that early stage are people who are your founding members. I remember the first person who paid for my newsletter, I'm like, you're God's gift to earth. You know, like, (laughs) thank you so much. I would happily never increase their price. That's an important dimension to think about your early supporters and to make sure you're taking care of them. But yeah, I think at a certain point, if you're at like a Netflix scale or a Spotify scale, even Strava Duolingo, you have probably enough paid subscribers at that point to think about most of the value of a price increase coming from your existing subscribers. If you assume we're kind of in that world, it's good to break out the impact by 
the revenue gain from existing subscribers versus future flow of new subscribers coming in. What we typically see when we've done price increases in the past is that they usually impact subscriber acquisition way more than subscriber retention. Now that's assuming you kind of execute the price increase well and that you're not going bonkers with it. You're not doubling your price. You know, you're doing the more incremental approach. But usually if you execute well, you won't see much churn from your existing subscriber base, but you will see a little pressure on new subscriber acquisition. So say you're adding 100,000 new subscribers per month and you increase the price by 10%. It's not crazy to see like a little bit of a step function drop down, you know, maybe 90,000 a month or 80,000 a month just kind of pulling money numbers out of thin air here. But the point being, the expectation should be that you're going to see a little bit of slowdown on acquisition. Whereas retention, you might not see too much of an impact. And again, that's why it's important to like figure out a way to thoughtfully increase price on existing subscribers. The basic equation is like, do you want fewer subscribers paying you more money? Or do you want more subscribers paying you less money? And then there's really a very few who can achieve the kind of more subscribers paying you more money. It does happen. One of the things a Spotify and a Disney Plus and others can't do because they are such a big brand is actually test the price increase on new users before they actually raise a price on existing users. And maybe that's actually a great way to think about it for apps that can get away with that is if you're not a brand name, if people don't know your price offhand, if the press isn't going to write about your price, then you can actually go ahead and see first what the impact is on new subscribers. And then if you find that sweet spot, maybe that's the time to then start thinking about rolling that price out to all the existing subscribers. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Testing price increases is really hard. If one person sees two different prices and they kind of figure out what you're doing, that can make its way to X or Reddit, and then you got a thing to deal with. But yeah, I mean, any kind of signal there can be helpful. Surveys can sometimes be somewhat helpful, but people say different things than what they end up doing. So I wouldn't put all your trust in those results. In those cases where you have raised prices in the past, have you done surveys? Is there kind of like price elasticity surveying that you've done? And was it helpful or, or do you feel like you really just have to experiment? We've definitely done a lot of surveys and not only to find like what our core price should be, but to think about what our most passionate fans would pay relative to like your core subscriber. It's kind of like you want to separate out what the top 1% are willing to pay. They maybe have more price elasticity or a higher willingness to pay a higher price for maybe not even that much different of a product relative to like your core product, which is what most people are buying. The equivalent on Substack would be we have a founding member tier. And if people choose that option, they can actually fill in their own price. And we see a lot of people go way above and beyond what the retail price is on the founding member. And some of those people just really want to support the writer. That's great to see. Yeah, I was actually going to bring that up. That one other option, and we even see this in streaming and Spotify and others, is that one way to raise your price without raising your price is to add a higher tier. So we were talking earlier about adding a big new feature at the same time you're raising your price. Well, another way to potentially do that is add that big new feature as a new premium tier on top of the existing tiers. I wonder if that's actually a better option than raising your price for some apps is actually starting to do the tiering thing. Do you have any thoughts there in the I mean, the problem with tiering is complexity. Is that how many prices are you showing? Your paywall gets confusing. What are your thoughts on tiering as a way to raise prices? I think tiers make a ton of sense. You know, without them, you're kind of forcing one price on everybody. When you know that people have different willingness to pay, I think it's good to keep it as simple as possible. More than three tiers, the consumer's brain might start to break. <laughs> the other thing that we're seeing in streaming is the introduction of ad-based subscription tiers at the lower end. And I think a lot of this is just reaffirming your point around you're trying to think about how many paid subscribers you can realistically get and what the revenue per subscriber is and how they break that out across different tiers, subscription tiers. And so if you're somebody like Netflix in the US and you're really bumping up against what could be your total addressable market, then introducing a lower price ad tier could make sense. 
Same thing with the other streamers. What we see in more of a passion-driven world, like the Substacks of the world or the Patreons of the world, there's this element of like the top 1% of fans who have like a much stronger set of feelings about their subscription to a certain product. We saw this at Crunchyroll. We had this thing called the t-shirt test, which was like, if you wear the t-shirt of that brand, then it's saying something about who you are, about your identity. And when you see somebody else wearing that Crunchyroll t-shirt, you have this immediate connection, this immediate trust. And it's a great symbol for the depth of relationship somebody feels about a brand. And so, yeah, not all subscriptions are created equal. And so I think something like Crunchyroll probably has a better shot at like a higher priced subscription tier that has some other stuff in it. Whereas Netflix's highest price tier is more like a family plan. It's a functional value prop. I think that point you just brought up about Netflix hitting their potential total addressable market in the US is actually something a lot of apps are maybe hitting and not quite realizing what wall they're hitting. I've heard a lot of folks in the industry say for everything from fitness apps to other apps in the space that you hit this 10 to 20 million a year ARR and very few apps can break beyond that. And maybe that's that, you know, you're not Netflix, you're not going to have 100 million subscribers or whatever it is. So these apps may be hitting that total serviceable market. Like, yes, everybody works out, but realistically, your fitness app is not going to be subscribed. There's so much competition in that space. People have so many different needs. Once you hit that $10, $20 million a year, you might actually be bumping up against it. And so then that's the time to then start thinking, okay, what are these tiers? How do we start letting people who are willing to pay more, pay more? You know, Visco is an app I use all the time and they raise prices and I still think it's cheap because it's like, that's just where I go when I have a photo I really like. I've been using the FitBod app and It's just been so perfect for my at-home workouts and it's 60 bucks a year. I've paid trainers 60 bucks an hour to come train me. I would pay so much more because of how well that product is fitting my needs. So yeah, I wonder if that total serviceable market is what some apps are starting to bump up against and need to start looking at how these bigger players are starting to diversify income streams. I think that's exactly right. It's hard to know when you're bumping up against that ceiling. The question we always got hit with at Crunchyroll was like, how many people will actually pay for an anime only streaming service? When we got there, we had 200,000 subs. And I remember us being so skeptical of ever getting beyond where we were. The idea of getting to a million, mind-blowingly hard. There was weeks where we would lose like a thousand subs, you know, or really slow inching along pacing. And we just kept getting that question, like how many people will actually pay for this? Fast forward to today, and I think there are over 12 million paid subscribers. And we didn't increase price for a long time. We really wanted to exhaust all the possible ways of bringing on new subscribers. Not to mention, like we tried to launch other products that were like solving tangential needs for people who were canceling Crunchyroll. So we tried a bunch of different things and only got to a price increase pretty deep into my time there, you know, after six or seven years of really focusing on paid subscribers and scaling that up as much as possible. I'm honestly shocked (laughs) that Crunchyroll did get to 12 million subscribers. I think there are maybe like two things going on simultaneously here. And I want to hear one about how you at Crunchyroll started to solve this and found new ways to grow and expanded that audience. But I think there's a second thing at play here that it's kind of the rising tide lifts all boats, that consumers are more and more willing to pay via subscriptions for things they care about, for things they value. And yes, there is subscription fatigue. People complain about how many subscriptions they have, but then look at the industry. It's growing because when you deliver value, people are willing to pay. So I think I wonder if some of Crunchyroll's growth was part of that rising tide, but then I'm sure y'all must have done a lot of work. So tell me about what it took to get from those tens of thousands of subscribers and not even believing you could hit a million to 12 million subscribers, which is just incredible. I mean, we could talk for a full day. (laughs) Give me the highlights. Give me the highlights. So the, the highest level, we thought a lot about how do we acquire more subscribers? How do we retain our existing subscribers? There's a lot of sub bullets in both of those. We did a lot of marketing stuff, a lot of partnership stuff, and those were really important. 
But at the end of the day, what's the most important was like what shows we had on the service. And then we tried to build a strong brand around that. And back to the t-shirt thing, it wasn't always about building the best video player or the best payments engine or the best website or apps. We were able to compete on kind of a different dimension because of the deeper relationship we had with our audience. And so we thought a lot about how do we build out a business around our subscribers and introduce other revenue streams like merch and events and gaming and a bunch of different things. And so that was useful because we didn't have to like have the best video player in line with Netflix or Amazon Prime of the world. But one of the things you mentioned there is expanding shows. So ultimately, and you talk about this in a lot of your blog posts, including the price increase, is that ultimately the amount of money you're going to be able to charge and the revenue you're going to get per customer just really boils down to how much value you're delivering. So it sounds like a lot of that growth had to do with just how do we deliver more and more and more value? That's exactly right. And I know that's like opaque and flippant to say, but it really is all that matters. And so what do you do from that? You got to really figure out why people are buying your product and try to double down as much as possible on that. But the hard part is you also got to keep an eye on why some of your audience is canceling and whether you can start trying to solve some of their problems and gradually expand from your core of your subscriber base. One example from Crunchyroll, when we got there, most of the people who were paid subscribers to Crunchyroll at that time were the most hardcore anime fans in the world. And we had to adjust how we welcomed new anime fans. And that's like a branding and vibe thing. And that showed up in some of the marketing stuff we did, but that was a big change. And honestly, it took a little bit of a change within the company from a cultural perspective because the company was all diehard anime fans. And so, yeah, I think there is mechanics like that to be mindful of and to think about like, okay, I need to figure out the value that my existing subscribers are getting. I need to make sure I'm reinforcing that. But I also need to be mindful of how to slowly expand from my core audience today too, if I want to continue driving subscriber yeah. growth. How do you figure that out? I mean, you actually talk about this in several other posts, but let's talk through aspects of that. You survey your users, you product analytics. How did y'all figure out who those core users were and what kept them? And then how did you figure out what those lighter users, who they were, and then how to kind of bring them deeper into the Crunchyroll experience? Surveys are crucial. And there's different ways to do that. You could do like live interviews, pick up the phone, talk to some of your most passionate, longest tenured subscribers, figure out why they have been around for a while. You could talk to people who are canceling like right away and try to get a sense of what's the difference here. One easy analysis we did pretty consistently in the streaming world was, this is back when free trials were a thing. You could do it with like the first billing month as well. But look at the people who are canceling their subscription early on. Look at the people who are making it through that period and look for the behavior that is different about those two groups and try to figure out early on what is indicative of risky behavior, what is signaling valuable behavior, try to bend the product in those directions. That onboarding period is like the most crucial part of a subscriber journey. And that could be the first day, the first app session, or the first month that somebody is using your product. That's usually the place to focus if you're really trying to like figure out why people are getting value from what you're providing and trying to figure out how to like bend the product more toward that direction. That's a more objective data analysis exercise. But yeah, I would definitely do the surveys and you could do that as part of onboarding or just kind of ad hoc to your whole audience. And there's different flavors of that. You could just send them like a Google form or you could literally hop on a Zoom and talk to some people and really dig into what they value and what they would like to see from your product. Yeah. So for the people who are canceling, how do you really suss out? Like there's cohorts that are just never going to subscribe. So there's, I think you say in one of your posts, there's three buckets. It's like the people who subscribe and say subscribe, the people who cancel, but you actually have potential with them. And the other people who are just not worth chasing. But how do you figure out who is who? And then especially, I think a lot of people will be thinking, okay, the people who cancel but are actually winnable, how do you suss out what's actually going to be valuable enough to keep them subscribed and go after that market? Yeah, there's like gradients here, I guess. Um, yeah. 
There's some people who maybe try your product and they ask for something that's totally abstract, totally different than what you're trying to do. In a lot of those cases, I think you just got to say, okay, well, thanks for coming by. We'll see you later. Then there are people who are asking for things that are not totally different than what you're doing today. For example, with Crunchyroll, we get a lot of requests for like popular shows or shows that were kind of under the radar that we could reasonably try to go get. And we go try to get it. If we got it, we'd email them and say, hey, this is now on the service. Do you want to come back? And maybe potentially offer some kind of discount to come back or trial period. It's kind of an intuition thing. I think most operators will probably be able to suss out, okay, this person just probably accidentally signed up or totally misunderstood our value prop before they signed up. Yeah, This person's pretty close. And I think we could win them back if we just made some slight adjustments or slightly bent our product in this direction. It's fascinating too in the consumer space, just how big the numbers can be is that if you have product market fit adjacency <laughs> where people are coming in for some reason, but you're just not quite solving their problem, if you figure that out and go from 10, 20% trial start rate to 25%, 30% trial start rate, it can just make such a dramatic difference in your business. And it's not like growth hacking your paywall. <laughs> you have to actually deliver the value. You actually have to figure out what they need and solve those problems. It feels like there's just so many competing things there, like how much effort you put into new features, how much you're testing your paywall, how much you're offering discounts. There's just so many yeah. things to be thinking about. I mean, the thing about writing the newsletter has been, this is all just like a balancing act. Yeah. And it just takes high judgment decision-making. There's no universal right answer to balancing between all these pieces. Right. Um, <laughs> I think it's like getting a strong sense of your business and like what is driving revenue growth and then being mindful when things start ticking in different directions. One thing that we talked a lot about in the streaming world it's like this pendulum swinging between different business priorities and growth and profitability and all these counter forces. And you're always just trying to like fine tune and tweak things and choose the right path, but it's all a balancing act and there's no universal right answer. And that's why it's been fun to write about the frameworks because I'm just trying to write out the constructs of how we made certain really hard, but important decisions. And one of the things you keep coming back to in a lot of your posts is that it really does depend on stage. Like if you're kind of early and pre-product market fit, maybe don't worry as much about retention, oh which gosh, is kind yes. of like counter advice to what a lot of people would expect. Like, oh, you need to solve the leaky bucket first through all these retention tactics and win back campaigns and all that. But when you're early, probably better to keep focus on product. It's interesting how you end up in these frameworks talking about the context around those different kind of growth stages. When you're pre-product market fit, you should really just be focused on trying to really find the sweet spot of what you want to do and the product you want to build and an audience. You should not be really worried about what your cancel flow looks like or overthinking price. It's really about a relentless focus on finding product market fit. And I know that's like another opaque phrase, but that's all that really matters early on. And so one of the risks... I have with writing the newsletter is there's a bunch of, I think, early stage writers on Substack reading it. And I really don't want them thinking about running paid ads out of the gate or thinking about how to better retain long-term subscribers. It's a total different set of priorities. And it's about just finding that initial traction, which is extremely difficult. Yeah. Interestingly, though, in one of your posts, you do kind of mention that when retention is super low, it might actually be time to just completely rethink things. So, I mean, it's going to vary business to business and Netflix looks way different than the kind of, like I was talking about, the median subscription app does have fairly low retention. But yeah, how, how do you decide, you know, is retention reasonable and there's a path to more value or is it just so low you need to like rethink things? Yeah, if you have like a bunch of people downloading your app, using it once and never using it again, I think you don't have product market fit at that point. It doesn't even have to be that extreme. If they use it three times in the first week, but then never come back, that could work for some consumer products, but for most, probably not. So I think retention is a part of evaluating whether or not you have found traction, but I don't think it's worth thinking too hard about, don't beat yourself up about like some of the 
retention stuff that we've written about, especially those growth tactics. You know, it's like offering discounts in the cancel flow or trying to solve the problem in the cancel flow. Yeah, there's different growthy tactics, which are really aimed at catching people on the fence about canceling before they actually cancel. I would put all that stuff out in the future after you have enough subscribers for that to be meaningful. Yeah. And that's a good point too. I mean, I hadn't thought about it quite this way, but it's like early on your product should be what retains, not growth hacks. Like if you're having to work so hard on subscriber lifecycle marketing and doing all these win back campaigns and offering discounts, then that's actually probably a sign that you need to double down and figure out what's wrong with the product, that the product, the value you're actually delivering is not what's retaining them. Yeah, exactly. All right, Reed, we could talk for four more hours and maybe uh, I'll have you back on at some point to talk through like 10 more blog posts because they're all so good. We got through like kind of one and a half or, or one and <laughs> two quarters, but it was so fun. And we'll link to all these blog posts that we mentioned and the growth croissant. But anything else you want to share as we're wrapping up? No, this was awesome. I would love to come back. Thank you for sharing the newsletter and thanks for having me on. It's been a blast. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a minute, please leave a review in your favorite podcast player. You can also stop by chat.subclub.com to join our private community.